Hoop Heads Podcast is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. You can't have one way of teaching, take shooting for example, like you can't have one way of teaching a skill and that's your only way because that one way is not going to work for every single player. Coach Matt Pugh grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. He played at Winnetonka High School and then played collegiately at Missouri Valley College in Marshall, Missouri. Coach Pugh served as a high school varsity basketball coach for 10 years. He was also an assistant college basketball coach for two years at John Wood Community College with a national tournament appearance in year one and a national runner-up finish in year two. Matt is currently a Pure Sweat basketball skills coach running Pure Sweat Skills Academies and traveling throughout the Midwest running team clinics as well as providing individual and team training in the Hannibal, Missouri and Quincy, Illinois area. When you're done listening to this episode, make a resolution to head over to iTunes or wherever you listen to the Hoop Heads podcast and leave us a five-star rating and review. Your awesome rating skills will help a wider audience of coaches, parents, and players find our show. Make sure you have your pen and paper handy so you can jot down some notes while you listen to this episode with Coach Matt Pugh from Pure Sweat Basketball. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast Matt Pugh from Pure Sweat Basketball. Matt, welcome. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's always fun to kind of um, take a take a few minutes and, and meet new people um, and uh, you know kind of share stories and and uh, learn. I'm 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 gonna probably gonna ask you guys as much as, as many questions as you guys ask me. So yeah, thank absolutely, you. Absolutely, we'll be ready for that. Uh, we're excited to get a chance to talk to you, find out more about what you're doing now and a little bit about your basketball background. So let's start there with how you got into the game of basketball as a kid and what it was about the game that really made you fall in love. Yeah. So really, um, I can't even really, I mean, I can't even really remember like an exact moment, you know, like some, some people talk about, you know, Oh, it was this, I had this huge epiphany and it was this time at this this place, this gym, all that stuff. I never really had that. Um, I I just remember playing for as I mean forever. Like I I just can always remember playing. So um, you know that kind of uh, is I just had a ball in my hand. So I, I don't really have an aha moment that kind of got me into the game, but um, was always just playing the game. When you were a kid, did you play multiple sports, or were you just a basketball guy from the very beginning? Yeah, I actually I did I did play multiple sports. Um, with probably the 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 two that I played was b- uh, basketball and baseball. So um, and actually I had a lot more success early on when I was young um, as a a baseball player to be to be quite honest with you. But um, just really I always and he, I, I think that a lot of people maybe can relate to this, but sometimes things you you don't necessarily end up doing the thing that you may be best at but more so the thing that you enjoy the most doing yeah i think that's a great point that a lot of people sometimes miss and we've actually heard that from some other coaches that we've had on that you know they may have been better at one particular sport and yet there was another one that they enjoyed more and sometimes it's funny how people end up going through that decision making process in terms of which sport they pursue whether it's at the high school level or end up you know pursuing at the college level just kind of depends I think on your own individual personality as far as where you end up with that for sure and 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 one thing I'll add to that just kind of piggyback and you guys tell me what you think but um I think a lot of that for me anyway goes back to you're probably going to work harder at the things that you enjoy 
more, you know, than maybe something that you're better at, but you just don't love it as much. And so I, I think your room for growth spending time doing things that you enjoy and are and have some sort of level of success at i think i think your ceiling is a lot higher with those things yeah, yeah. go yeah. ahead Jason. yeah i completely agree I, I was much better at baseball when i was like a kid kid like you said i i, I just loved it but i think if i tried to, to continue to play baseball when i was like in my like teenage years and, and into college or whatever, I, I wouldn't have gotten any better. Whereas basketball, I just continued to work and work and work. And I actually probably, you know, I didn't start to play really good at basketball until I was like 25, 26. I was okay. I was never great. But I, I definitely sure. think now, I definitely think now because I love the game, I just, I always am working on stuff. And here I am 32 years old running a basketball practice every day. And uh, <laughs> when I'm working with the kids, I'm working on something myself too, you know. It's just because I, I want to get better even at this age. Yeah, I think one sure. of the things that I always try to tell parents is, you know, you this is one of the dilemmas and I, I've, I've faced this dilemma myself with my own kids is – how much do you push your kid to work and practice and try to get better at whatever it is? It doesn't have to be basketball, but it could be anything. And one of the things that I've always tried to live by, and I, I've tried to espouse this to other parents, is that you know if if it, if the practicing is not coming from your kid, they're probably never going to get good enough if they don't love doing it. They're they're never going to be they're never going to practice enough to be really great at it. So you should just kind of let them do provide them with opportunities but don't force it because if they're if all the if the only time reason they practice is because of you they're never going to practice enough to be really good at whatever the activity is a hundred percent a hundred percent so when you were growing up can you describe a little bit about how the way you came up in the basketball world is maybe different from how kids today are coming up because obviously in the last 10, 15, 20 years, the landscape of summer basketball and training and just the way the whole off season slash AAU slash travel slash high school situation has just changed tremendously uh, yeah. in the last 15 or 20 years. So can you talk a little bit about how your experience was different from the experiences that maybe some of the kids that you're working with today, the experience that they go through? Yeah, for sure. Um, I I think the biggest thing, probably the you know, and we could talk about a hundred different things for sure. But some of the kind of highlights and things that I that I notice for me that stick out are, you know, there. The, I feel like today there's just far less opportunity, and maybe it's not far less opportunity. Maybe it's just kids just don't do it as much. But less, there's just less free play everything has to be organized i feel like for them to for them to play you know there's so many whether it's whether it's aau or whether it's you know just like your local traveling basketball team or a select team or whatever that is i, I just think that there's there, kids don't just play to play like they it, everything has to be organized for them whereas when when i was playing you know i'm i've got a daughter that's in seventh grade and, and she actually just finished up her season tonight, and um, but you know I, I kind of watch her and and her age level of kids and and, and the kids that I'm working with now, um, you know at, at the high school and even college level is they, they just they don't just play anymore um, and and everything if it's not organized and there's not like an official and there's not like you know <laughs> the you know the a clock and a scoreboard going it's like they just don't have as much interest I feel so that that's probably one of the biggest things um, that I feel like is different from when I was coming up as as a young player playing the playing the sport I mean we played you know we had like three courts in the neighborhood uh, you know is you know our, our our buddies houses in one you know we had either it was either the front driveway or it was like a, a patio in the back or something like that but we would play I mean we would play you know five six sometimes seven days a week you know as long as the weather wasn't super crazy cold or there wasn't you know some torrential downpour or something I feel like we were we were always playing and it was just it was just play you know and and those were some of the most competitive environments though that you know I was able to put myself in coming up did you ever play in the torrential downpour? Because I remember playing in the torrential downpour just because we wanted to play. Did, did yeah, you ever? usually, yeah, it was usually like 
we would be in the middle of a game or the series was tied 3-3, you know? So we were, it was like game seven. And so we had to, you know, so we had to, somebody had to win or lose. That There was none of this, oh, hey, you know, we'll pick it up later. No, like somebody was going to go home winner and somebody was going to go home yeah, a loser. Yeah, I can never and, imagine kids nowadays playing in the pouring rain. I think if you told them they were playing, that you used to play a series, you know, a seven-game series uh, with the same two-on-two team or three-on-three team, I think kids today would kind of look at you like you were crazy. They wouldn't even know what you meant as you tried to describe that. I think you're 100 percent Yeah, I think you're 100% on, Matt, with, with that description. To me, that's one of the biggest differences, and it's one of the things that I always tell people I feel bad for my own kids in a sense that they're never going to experience that opportunity like you described. I used to go and we had some neighborhood courts that were, uh, you know, in my local community and they were a short bike ride away from me. And I used to go and play when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old with the high school kids and with the college players and with, you know, adults. And to me, that was the greatest experience, not just from a basketball standpoint, from just from some of the people that I got to know as a result of playing that kind of pickup basketball. And today, kids just don't do that it's interesting to go back and you know I'm not sure when exactly that flipped and I think there's a number of you know different reasons for it one I think we we as parents today parent much differently you know our parents at least speaking for myself you know like my parents would you know it'd be a summertime and you know I'd get on my bike and go ride somewhere in the neighborhood and you know they, they generally knew where I was, but they didn't have any real idea of, you know, they couldn't pinpoint my exact location the way we can today. And we just don't let kids out of the house to go and do those things the same way that, you know, our parents did. And then I think the other part piece of it is now, even if you wanted to play pickup basketball, I'm not sure where you could find a game, at least around here by where we are in Cleveland, uh, you just don't see, you know, you go by, you know, you go by an outdoor court nowadays and, you know, they're empty. Um, cause, cause to your, yeah, because to your point, you know, everybody wants to play with an official, you know, in a gym with coaches and with mom and dad in the stands. And it's just uh, it's it's a totally different. It's a totally different world. And I think that's a great point that you just hit on. And, and something that I was actually, you know, as, as, as we're going through this, I'm actually kind of I'm taking some notes as we go too, uh, just because it's a learning opportunity, I think, for everybody involved here. But, um, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a contradiction when I think about it in the terms and in, in the fact that. Like I think some of the biggest benefits to coming up in that environment was there wasn't a coach, you know. Um, we weren't calling plays. We were, we we were learning. You, you know, you're we improvising. Were like, you're being creative. Yeah, you're, yeah. yeah, you're 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 learning. Okay, hey, I tried this three, you know, three straight times. We had the ball. And nothing positive happened. I we either turned I either turned it over or you know so and so we made a bad pass well, whatever it was. But like I just feel like you know and and that's kind of contradictory for me to say that. But I think some of the biggest lessons in me learning how to play came from not having a coach there, kind of directing us and telling us where to go and how to organize ourselves and where to be and what the play was and what the action was and what the reads should have been and this that and the other and now like <laughs> what i do now i mean i've been that coach obviously and then now from a skills coaching and player development perspective like you're trying to teach kids you're trying to teach kids how to do basically what we were able to do on our own so i i, I think that's an interesting angle yeah basketball is such a decision making sport and i think that a lot of times especially if you grow up all the time where there's always a coach and especially depending on the kind of coach you have you know when when a coach tries to dictate or control a lot of the action out on the floor it sort of takes away that decision making like Jason said the creativity piece of it is missing whereas when you're on the playground or in the driveway you know you can try a bunch of stuff because there's no adult there to correct you or to you know again make you feel bad in some cases or whatever it might be you know (laughs) again again depending on the style of coach that you had um, you're just more free when you're playing with your friends or when you're playing on a playground the repercussions of making a mistake or missing a shot are less. Now, unless you're on the playground, you're going to have to sit for four or five games if you lose. Yeah, Maybe when you get a little that, older. That's but, the other thing. We can yeah. go into that. We can go. That's all another conversation. It's, it, certainly, it certainly is. And that's one of the things that I think, again, kids, kids, kids miss out on that too, for sure. But just sticking with what we were talking about, I think that, you know, when you get an opportunity to be creative when – there aren't adults watching and when there isn't a scoreboard and when there's people sitting in the stands that are 
watching and critiquing you or going or, to critique you after or telling you what to do from the stands I coach I hate it I hate parents just shouting things out it's okay. not what we want them to do we you know we we sit here and we spend practice after practice working on something and then and then you put these shoot little, it sh- shoot you, it you, you, then you put, then you put these middle school I te- I coach I'm coaching girls right now and then I'll start coaching boys after the new year but you you teach them all these things and and you put them in these positions that your dad's yelling one thing who's probably been their coach at one point or another throughout their career he's yelling uh, one thing from the stands and that's completely contradicting what we're trying to work on as a team and and it's just it puts them in a terrible spot because they don't know who to who to appease and, and make sure. happy well, so and then, so it's yeah. always so tough for them and they know that what whatever whatever choice they make they're going to disappoint somebody and so <laughs> and so that that's a ton of pressure when you're talking about you know a, a middle school aged kid for sure yeah it makes it very tough and that was one of the things that you know, I know that I've spent a lot of time, whether it's writing on the blog or we've talked about it on the podcast numerous times. And obviously, whenever I talk to somebody in person, I always try to get that point across that you may think you're helping your child by, you know, yelling instructions from the stands. But the reality is all you're doing is confusing them and putting them in, to your point, a very difficult, you know, very difficult position where they're going to disappoint somebody. Either mom or dad is going to be disappointed or coach is going to be disappointed. And that's a tough position to put a kid who's. 10, 11, 12 years old in that type of position. Yeah. So it, let's go ahead and go to that next point that we, you know, we're talking about, which is, you know, if you're going to go out and play pickup games, you're going to sit and lose, uh, you know, you lose a game on the playground. You, uh, you know, you got to sit three or four or five games. Um, I feel, I feel like one of the things that that developed in me and players in my era was, that competitive drive where, hey, I don't want to lose this game because I know I'm going to sit. And now I think sometimes, and I can see this with my own kids and some of the teams that I've coached, you know, you lose a game and they're down about it for a little bit. And, you know, an hour later they got another game. So in a way it teaches resiliency. You got to be able to bounce back quick and put the losses behind you. But in another way, it sort of devalues each individual game and that competitiveness because, hey, I know if I lose this one, I got another game coming in an hour. So what's the big deal? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it, it really does, I and mean, I, I think that's something that that and and something else that that I've I've kind of thought about is, and and I've had these conversations with some you know former coaches of mine, and and then coaches that I've been fortunate enough to play for and and build relationships with is. I think something else, and this will not probably be a a, a popular perspective, but you know, I think that when when you lost i think that that became whether that was good bad and different whatever that whatever that was when when you lost that became a part of how people identified you and it, it, it doesn't mean that though that you were a loser it just means that you lost and like for us to have that like knowing that we were going to leave that court or you know, show up at school the next day or whatever, and, and and our peers and the people that we're you know the name on the front of the jersey that we're trying to represent and and you know and represent the right way and create some pride around. When you lost, like that's people people recognize that like they you got that was part of your identity at that point in time was that you lost. You know, and, you know, to say it sounds harsh to say that you were a loser, but in fact, like, that's exactly what happened. Like, you lost. That means you were a loser for just for that moment. Now, it's going to take us a few days to to get that turned around. It's not going to get turned around in two hours, you know. I could totally relate to that. When you're as you as you were saying that. I vividly could think back to, you know, I mean, I didn't lose that many games in high school, so I have vivid memories of the games that I did lose. And I remember just dreading playing a Tuesday night game that we had lost and then having to go into school the next day and walk around all day knowing that we had lost and then to carry that feeling until Friday night when we would get a chance to get back out on yeah. the court. And, to, and again, to your point, to turn myself from a loser back into a winner. I just remember those school days the next day after a loss, just being miserable the entire day. And, you know, the next couple of days until we were able to yeah. get back out and play and win again. Yeah. And it's it just, it, it, the way that, you know, just the, again, it's, it's that whole, 
you know, and, and people talk about it and, and I think there's something to it. I think that we, we create, you know, um, environments that aren't necessarily real, you know, for, and, and I say we, um, that that's not to say any of the coaches or, or parents or anybody that's, that's listening to this podcast are that way, but I just feel like we're, you know, and even me as an, as an educator, as a, as a teacher, I, I still feel like we create a lot of, you know, fake environments for these young people coming up where there's just chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. And as you guys well know, like when you get out into the quote unquote real world, and you know it's 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 not like that and then now when they when you get out there and you do face that real adversity of losing you know and that comes in many ways you know many different shapes and forms for you know obviously but when you have to face that adversity you've never had to do that and so now when you're having to do that when you have a bunch of other responsibilities on your plate and you're no longer just a a student a player or a, or, or or a kid that doesn't have outside responsibilities like a family or, you know, a house payment, a car payment and all these other things. When the first time you have to face real adversity is in that environment, like you're going to really struggle having to build yourself back up and have some resiliency and figure out how do I turn this into something positive and get this thing back on track. Yeah, I love that. I think you're a hundred percent right. I just heard something the other day. I was actually watching a video as I was renewing my USA basketball coaching license uh, the other night, and I was listening to the video from uh, you know Coach Don Showalter, who we were lucky enough to have on the podcast, and he said something that I thought kind of fits exactly what we're describing here, which was you know you have freedom of choice, but you don't have freedom of consequences, and that's kind of what we're describing. In that you know in schools, a lot of times, again to your point. We give kids multiple chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. And a lot of times the consequences aren't as harsh as they are in real life. And so you can make choices. You know, we all have choices in life and you can do whatever you want. But the reality is, is that the choices you make lead to real consequences. And again, especially once you get out into, as you said, the real world, those consequences become much more real, for lack of a better word. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just interesting, again, as a, I think one of the things that I think is, is, is very cool is the fact that, you know, when you're on a daily basis, when you're in the classroom, uh, as Jason and I are and as you are, you get this completely different perspective on, you know, not just coaching, but you get a different perspective on kids because you're dealing with all, you know, an entire spectrum. You're not just dealing with athletes. You're dealing yeah. with all different kinds of kids and you kind of see how it all fits together and sometimes, you know, how athletes you know, react differently to things in the classroom at times and just, you know, how they mm -hmm. have a, have a different perspective. And so I think it's, yeah. you know, it's something that, you know, sports, we want to use that as a vehicle to be able to teach kids some of these life lessons that we're talking about right now. For sure. And, and, and I think we, I think it, you know, athletics is, is one of the, the best, you know, teachers of, of all those things, and um, I, you know, I, I, I think that that gets lost at times. We all, we all know that, but especially, you know, coaches and, and people that have played and been through it, we all know that, and 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 we give it lip service, but I don't, I don't think that we give it enough. I guess maybe concentrated attention. Yeah, a lot of times it's just, you know, again, I think that sometimes it gets lost. And I think we do a better job in coaching today of being aware of those things. Again, if you go back maybe to the era when I was playing and you're in the you know late 80s, early 90s, I don't think there was the same emphasis on culture and relationship building and some of the things that are very, very important now to reach today's athlete that once you build up those things, it gives you an opportunity to not just teach a kid, you know, basketball skills and X's and O's, but it gives you a chance to really impact their life, not just on the court, but also off the court as well. For sure. For sure. Can you talk a little bit about when you were a high school coach and what were some of the things that you did that you tried to build into your program in terms of not just not X's and O's and, you know, style of play necessarily, but just some, huh? of the cult, just some of the culture things that you tried to build into your program when you were coaching high school basketball. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, some of the th- when when I was when I was at the high school level, um, you know, a lot of the things that, that that we were trying to do from a from a big picture perspective, um, and, and kind of things that uh, you know are pillars, I guess, so to speak. You know, th- a lot of the things that that we were trying to get was was just little stuff like. Um, you know, being on time, you know, being on time, you know, be, like being early, um, you know, having a, having a purpose for, for what you're doing. I think that's huge. Um, and that may be, maybe one of the absolute biggest things that, that I tried to get our players that I was fortunate enough to coach, try to get them to understand that, no matter if you're a a basketball first kid that was there, you know, with goals to go play at, you know, and 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 dreams to go play at the next level, or if you were just a one, you know, a role guy that that was that was maybe a multi-sport athlete that was, you know, planning on going and playing, you know, football at the next level or whatever that was for for each kid. I think that you still. I think there's a lot of power in understanding that everything you do has to be have have has to have a purpose for one, and I think that um, you know just having making sure that everything means something and that one percent is a big deal. You know, I, I think that that we can all look back on examples where a last shot was missed or we somebody turned it over on the last possession and obviously those and those things get really really magnified but you forget about the possession the third possession of the second quarter where you kind of took that play off a little bit defensively and you know you weren't able to help the helper and and take away that wide open three that got knocked down you know something like that so yeah, I, I think that that purpose I, I think was probably the biggest thing to be honest with you. That everything we did had a purpose, and there was no we weren't just doing something just be, just to be doing it. I completely agree about the whole you know looking at the one thing, but maybe there were other things. Like you think about last year in the finals when when Jr. got that rebound and ran away with the ball instead of putting it back up. No one remembers that George Hill missed that free throw. Everyone no, remembers that. Stupid. Everyone remembers Jr. running away from the Brown, running away, and LeBron's facial expression, and that became a meme. So I think I think yeah. I completely agree. And think about it on you know high school scale. There, there's lots of smaller incidents that don't get remembered because of one big thing that happened. Yeah, and and, and trying to and it's something else that I think that that carries over and in, into into bigger things than basketball is is consistency. Like doing something consistently, you know, and it, it can be a tiny, a, a tiny thing, um, but the, the, that's how massive change happens. Massive change and massive things happen not from this giant, huge, massive action. What, how, how those things happen? How major change does happen is doing that one thing consistently day after day after day after day after day and then and then all of a sudden you look at the big huge body of work and now you know it looks drastically different from what it did you know say a a year ago so I, i think there's a lot of power and consistency too how much time did you spend when you were coaching in high school talking about things like what we just talked about with your team? Was that something that you would talk about in, let's say, team meetings, or was that something that was just sort of daily built into your practices? How did you go about conveying some of those messages that we're talking about right now in terms of consistency and focusing on every play and that kind of thing? Did you build that into practices, or was that sort of a separate entity that you addressed uh, like in meetings or in separate things with players yeah it was it, it, it was more it was probably and I, I did probably didn't do it very, I mean I didn't do a very good job of it obviously probably looking back on it but um you know it, it was separate for us for the most part um and obviously there are times you know in practice and, and you know during games where it, it it happens to come up but for us, you know, um, and early on, you know, I was a high school coach for uh, for eleven years, and 
um, early on in my coaching career, as we all, you know, look back on our early years, like, what was I doing? But absolutely, uh, <laughs> but like, that made no sense. I wasted everyone's time doing that. But, um, you know, so early on in my, in my, in my college career, I didn't do, or my high school coaching career, I didn't do very, very much of it. Now, later on, you know, towards the end of my high school coaching career, I think we did a lot of really good things in terms of giving players um, resources uh, to to look back on and use and use as tools and resources. You know that we could direct them to, and um, kind of what that looked for uh, look what that looked like for us was all of our players had what you know a, a a notebook you know and inside that was everything from you know it was basically like a, a player's manual almost you know um, everything from scouting reports to um, every once in a while we we we'd give them practice you know we would give them the practice plan every once in a while um, and then we had what we what we called culture documents and those were things that just like if me or anybody on our staff happened to pick up something or read something or you know listen to something that we thought we really really liked and thought that fit kind of what we stood for and, and how we wanted to be viewed um, and how we wanted people to think about our program, then those were things that we would, you know, run copies off for them and, and stick them in inside of those, uh, inside those player notebooks in those, uh, culture document sections. So I, it was, it's actually funny that we're, we're talking about this because just a, a, about two weeks ago, I actually, um, my former assistant who still teaches, um, with me at, at the high school that I'm currently teaching at now. And, uh, he, he actually found an old, uh, coaches, um, copy of, of one of those of one of those manuals and so I was going and looking back through all that stuff which was kind of neat to kind of reminisce and and look back and reflect on uh you know what you did and how you did it and what you would maybe do differently and what you would keep so yeah it was it was cool but that's kind of how we addressed you know those types of things when it comes to you know things bigger than basketball and how it relates to everyday life yeah, absolutely. I'm a big believer in having some type of team notebook, and I've done that. Um, I haven't coached with the high school team for a while, but with my own kids, uh, when I coach their travel and AAU teams, we put together a team notebook with, you know, again, different things to your point, uh, you know, related to the culture and what we expect. And, and then we do some things where we'd ask them questions and get them communicating. And, you know, we'd sit sometimes for, you know, 20 minutes before practice and just go through, you know, some of the pieces of that notebook and get them talking and communicating with one another. And I think that's a big part of, of really growing them as a team and then growing them as not just basketball players, but as people. And I, I think that if you're a coach out there and you're listening and you don't incorporate some type of team notebook and obviously everybody would do it differently and the things that you know each sure. individual coach might include in that and what they feel are important you know could be different but I think just the idea of having a team notebook some place where you can put in the things that you describe where you find something that you know whether it's just a quote or it's a an interesting article or something that's inspirational uh, I think it's a great way to be able to bond everybody on your team sort of in the same way. They're all getting that same information and then you can process it and talk about it as a team. It's a great way to build communication and camaraderie within your team. hundred percent. So what, when you, when you were coaching high school, what was your biggest challenge as a high school coach year in and year out? What was the thing that really kept you up at night that you're saying man I, this is this is my biggest this is my biggest challenge every day when I come into when I come into practice or when I'm heading into a game you know probably for me it was it was it was getting it was figuring out how to get guys to view their role as more than just a role you know, um, and and I don't remember who I stole this from, but I I stole it from somebody. And one thing that that really worked for me, um, and if there's any coaches out there that are that are struggling with with any of this, you know, I, I don't know. This may not this may not help you, but it, it it might. I don't know. So you might want to give it a shot, maybe. But one thing that did work um, that I really liked was we would we would talk about being instead of being all state or 
you know, um, all re- you, all region or all district or, you know, however your postseason stuff is, is set up wherever you're at. Um, we would talk about being like an all state rebounder, you know, um, or being, being the, being in the top three for, um, you know, uh, hockey assists, um, being in the, you know, being all district in, um, enthusiasm off the bench, you know, little things like that. And, that really kind of changed changed perspective for for a few of our guys that maybe and, and we've all coached those guys and, and and players where they might think that they are and it, it you know a number two scorer you know or number two option um, on your team, but reality is is that while they may very well could be that in order for this team to be the best team that it possibly can be, then they've got to be the, you know, the all state assist guy, not the second leading scorer on our team. Yeah. I think that one of the things that gets lost sometimes with coaches and especially at the younger levels at high school, you know, you have some assistants that can help you with that and keep you on track. And I know one of the challenges that I always have is I'll get these great ideas, kind of like what you just described of, all right, I got to make sure I recognize our best rebounder. I got to make sure I do this. And then I realize that, oh yeah, I'm just one guy and I don't really have anybody keeping statistics and I don't have huddle or crossover feeding me all the yeah, stats. And totally. so, yeah. all right. So for, you know, I might, I might keep that up for, you know, two, three, four games. And then eventually it's just as one guy, my momentum sometimes will peter out and I won't be able to, you know, I won't be able to sustain that, unfortunately, which is on me as a coach. But I think the point, the greater point is, is that by recognizing things that you think are important, whether they're actual statistical categories within a basketball game or like what you described, which I really liked is, you know, the most enthusiastic player on the bench or, you know, maybe the kid who gives out the most high fives or there's there's tons of different ways that you can recognize those kinds of players who maybe aren't making a huge contribution in a game, but maybe they're making a huge contribution in practice or maybe they are the most enthusiastic kid or maybe they're the one that organizes the team dinners before the game or they're they get everybody together to go to the movies and there's ways that you can recognize that and recognize the value in it and i think as a coach sometimes we get caught up in some of the things that are going on on court and we get caught up with our best players or our you know our starting five and that player eight nine ten eleven twelve sometimes gets get neglected and i think if you're really going to have a good team You've got to have buy-in from kid one all the way through kid kid twelve, and by recognizing some unsung contributions, I think you're really going to be able to do that and get the maximum out of you know every kid on your team. Yeah, and you know, and as you're as you're kind of talking through that, I'm I'm thinking and and things are popping up for me and something else that I really struggled with as a coach and probably you know even in my. In in what I'm doing now, um, at time, and I've, I've gotten a lot better at it. But at t- you know, I I think at, at the time, especially when I was coaching, was, you know, um, you do feel limited at times, especially in terms of staff and things of that nature. Where you know, you may be at a smaller school where y- you may be your assistant might be the girls' head coach. You know, so you may not have a full time assistant or something like that. So something that I struggled with was keeping it simple. You know, um, I look back and and I I probably overcomplicated a lot of things um, for a lot of our players. Um, And 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 I think keeping it simple is something that that's hard to do. Because when simple's not working, you know, when you're on a right. when you're on five or six game skid, and you're like, okay, hey, but I just got to keep hammering away. I think there's a there's a weird, um, and it, it, there's a weird spot that you get into, and it, and it's hard to 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 know. And I I don't have the answer, but it is hard to know when to stick to what you're doing, and when to pivot when to make a change. Um, that was always, that was always something that was really, really hard for me. Um, as a, as, as a high school head basketball coach, I would bet that today 
that's even more difficult because of the wealth of information that yeah. is right at a coach's fingertips today. I mean, you're, if you're a coach today, you know, you can go online and find, I mean, again, millions and millions of videos oh, and resources and things. And I can only imagine that if, you know, you're, you're struggling and you're in a three game losing streak and you're like, all right, what can we do to change this up? And suddenly you're searching or you're talking to friends and they're like, well, what about this? Have you seen this? Take a look at this. And I can just see where you can get overwhelmed. And then to your point, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you can only imagine the message that you're conveying to your players and how overwhelmed they can feel. So I think it is a challenge to keep yeah. things simple and really focus on, hey, what do we do? What do we do well? One of the things that I always believed in as a coach, and I continue to believe this, is is I want to spend as much time and focus as I can on what my players do and what my team does and worry very, very little about what my opponent's going to do because in a lot of cases yeah. – my own players have a hard enough time remembering what we're supposed to do, let alone worrying about what the other team is doing. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. so oh, I think yeah. if you focus on coaching your own team, I found, at least in my own experience, that when I focus on what we're doing and not really worry about what the other team's doing, I usually tend to get better results. Yeah, and, 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 and I would do it so differently if, if I ever did it again. But, you know, I would do far less in terms of, you know, sets and, 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 you know, you know, and, and quick hitters and, and things of that nature. I would, I would have far less of those things and I would, and I would play and teach a lot more out of, out of concepts, you know, um, I would do a lot more concept based stuff rather than, um, you know, a to B to C, you know, quick hitter. We want this shot with this guy. And I know that there's a time and place for that for sure. But I do think that in terms of keeping it, I think that's a a way in my opinion, looking back and looking back on it, that would be a way for me that would work to, to kind of force me into that. Let's, let's kind of keep this thing simple and not go crazy to where we're, you know, like you said, overload on information and changing things every third day just because we had a, a bad night where we, you know, were struggling off, you know, the, the high ball screen or whatever it might be. Yeah, and I think the more you can teach, you know, hearing you talk about, you know, set plays, and again, obviously, depending on what level you're coaching at, you know, there's more or less of a necessity for those to be a part of what you're doing. But I think for any coach, uh, you know, if you can teach your kids to be, better decision makers within the context of the game, you're going to end up with a better result regardless of what offense you're running or what defense you're running or whether you're a fast-breaking team or you're a walk it up the floor or you press or you play man-to-man, whatever it is. I think if your kids learn how to make better decisions within the context of the game, then whatever system you're ultimately running, you're going to be better off. And I think that's where, you know, the kind of the games-based practice theory of, you know, you've got to be able to have practice look and feel like the games do, I become much more a bigger proponent of that type of style where you, um, you know, you put kids in three on three situations or you put them at a disadvantage advantage situation and then make them play and react out of that. So maybe you have an action at the beginning that starts everything that might be part of your offense or part of a situation that you might see frequently on defense. And then after that, it's just the kids playing and making decisions and with your yep. guidance and stepping in and giving them pointers after, you know, well, what did you see there? And why did you make that decision? And that's something that, again, I probably did much much less of when I was a young coach, you did more of the, you know, block practice of, you know, yeah. hey, we're going to do 10, you know, we're going to do 10 yeah. crossovers yeah. to a layup here, you know, and, and, you know, where it's not really, where it's not really in context. Sure. hundred percent. Yeah. It sounds like you've been to some pure sweat workouts, man. Yeah. Uh-huh. Hey, I, I probably, I, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, it's amazing how just the, you know, the training world and the coaching world has opened up where I started writing this blog that that I write probably now gosh it's been it's been at least 4 years that 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 I since I started writing it and in the course of doing that I feel like I be, I have become a much better coach slash you know whether it's you know coaching my own kids in a, in a team setting or whether it's being a skill development coach with my business that I have here with Head Start Basketball I just feel like <clears throat> I've become so much better because 
writing that blog, I just went out and looked at what other people were doing. I researched and I, you know, I'm looking for articles and looking for ideas. And in the course of that, you know, you yeah. come across some people that are doing some great things. And of course you come across some people that you disagree with what they're doing, but you come across a lot of people that are doing great things. And I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount. If I compare where I was and what I thought about when I was 23 years old and I had just got <laughs> playing and I thought I knew everything and, you know, I thought I was going to walk in and be the world's greatest oh, coach man. and, and, you know, and now I look at it and I'm like, I, I realize how little I actually know. And I'm just constantly looking for great people that I can learn from, whether it's, you know, by talking to them in person through the podcast, like we're doing tonight, or whether it's picking up somebody's book or whether it's, you know, just watching a video online or reading an article there, there's amazing, it's amazing the information that's out there. If you want to become more educated. For sure. Yep. No doubt about it. And I think that makes a huge, huge difference in the quality of coaching out there. I think I think coaches today are much more aware of things that they should be doing and, and different ways of approaching it within your own philosophy. Uh, I just think that the coaching is better today than it's than it's ever been. Oh, with no no question about it, no question about it. And the one thing that I think that um, you know has 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 helped that aspect of it in terms of the coaching aspect is is technology and is is all these you know connecting platforms where you can reach so many more people in such a, a much more efficient faster you know manner um you know and it's, it, then it just becomes a matter of are you willing to kind of put in on just a little bit of legwork yeah, it's amazing. Since we started the podcast, and I've told a couple other different guests the same thing, but you know, when we started this, we really didn't have any idea of where it was going to go. And we've been fortunate enough to have some great guests on that some of them have been connected. And you know, one guest then recommends that we, hey, you should talk to this guy and you should talk to this guy. And you know, we've talked to coaches who they, you know, they have these connections where, you know, you may not want to share offensive systems or ask questions of your crosstown rival right in your neighborhood. But yeah. if I'm here in Ohio and I'm friends with a coach in Arizona or a coach in California, why wouldn't I call him up or get on a text, you know, a group text and bounce ideas and bounce questions and bounce situations and scenarios off of each other and help one yeah. another. And that's what we're finding that a lot of guys are doing. And to your point, you know, you go back even 10 years ago and none of that was, you know, it wasn't possible. I mean, I'm sure there weren't, you know, there might have been guys who occasionally talked to somebody, you know, a friend they had across the country, but it certainly wasn't happening to any degree of regularity the way it is now. It's amazing. No, not at all. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Alan Stein Jr. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, Order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. So when you got done coaching in high school, you had an opportunity to move up and coach at the community college level. Can you talk a little bit about, first of all, why you made that leap and then what the transition was like from coaching in high school and moving on to the college level? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we you know, I was uh, – when I got kind of towards the end of end of my high school like coaching career, we, we just we just got to a point where I felt like the 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 program needed to go in a certain direction, um, and as you know, um, as as I don't remember who told me this or who where I heard it, but somebody said that there's two types of coaches. There's coaches that are have have been fired and there's coaches that are going to be fired and so at that point <laughs> i was one of those ones that had i stuck that thing out i was probably going to be one of those ones that was going to be fired <laughs> and so um to, you know and, and 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 that's that's just to be honest and 
um, you know, I just did. We, we just couldn't see eye to eye in, in terms of come to, you know, agreement on in, in how we kind of wanted that thing to look. I had a, I had a different vision for it than uh, my my administration at that time. And so I just I just decided that um, it was it was better for me to just kind of step away from it. And that led me to, you know, it's that whole, it's, it's that whole thing, you know, when, when one door closes, one more opens and, um, a good friend of mine that, that I had been able to develop a relationship with, you know, working camps for, for him and, and doing some different things for him and getting to know him in the area as a, as a basketball guy was, uh, you know, coach Brad Hoyt at John Wood community college in Quincy, Illinois. And, um, he said, Hey, we'd love to have you. Would you have any interest? And I, you know, it took me about three seconds to say, yeah. And, uh, then that's kind of how I got into the, uh, you know, junior college level, um, as an assistant. And I, I, I tell you, it was one of the better experiences, um, in terms of me, growing as a coach, uh, because I was, you know, after being a head coach for, um, let's see, it would have been five, six, eight, eight, seven, eight years at the high school level. Once you, once you're a head coach and then you go to be an assistant coach, you remember and you understand, you know, you're fresh off of that. So what I was able to do was, was, think about all the things that when I was, the, when, when I was the guy once one seat up on that bench, what were, what were some of the things that, man, I wish I had somebody to do this, or I wish I had somebody to do that thing. Um, those, the, those were some of the things that I tried to, you know, um, help coach Hoyt with, uh, things that I knew that, that maybe weren't, in his wheelhouse in terms of not that he couldn't do them, but just in terms of he has a lot of demands on his time. You know, he's the, he's an athletic, he, he was the athletic director um, at the time and still is at the college. And so he, he's got that role and, you know, he's got a point of emphasis where that's in, in his wheelhouse that he teaches the best. And um, I was able to kind of come in and, um, I think provide a little bit of value in terms of what I did best. And those two things kind of meshed pretty well together and, you know, uh, had a great two years there. I think what I hear you saying, and it, it's something that I've thought about a lot because I spent the first 13 my, years of my career as a varsity assistant coach and, uh, with the same guy. And then I spent two more years with, uh, a guy who had been our JV coach. I was the varsity assistant at my school district for a long, long time. And when I first got my job, I definitely thought that you know I was going to be there a year or two and then move on and get a head coaching job. And it turned out that I became really good friends with the guys on staff. And as a result, we we all stayed together for a long time. And that was it was tremendous. But I think one of the things that I always think about is that whether whichever role you have, whether you're a head coach or you're an assistant coach, I think if you've been in the other role previously, I think you do a better job of understanding and helping the person who is in the opposite role from the one that you have. So if you're a head yes. coach and you've been an assistant before, then you know kind of what it's like to be the assistant. And so you tend to treat your assistant better, whether that be giving them more responsibility, whether that be uh -huh. just the way you interact with them. And then conversely, if you know, you're, you're an assistant coach and you've been a head coach before you understand the demands that are placed on a head coach and you try to do everything that you can to be able to alleviate some of the things and tasks that the head coach, you know, may do themselves. But if you can take those off their plate so that they can focus on the things that are most important for a head coach to be doing, you end up having the kind of staff that really works well together. And I, I think that that's something that, you know, I hear you saying as having gone from being a head coach at the high school level to being an assistant, you realized where you could kind of fill in gaps for your head coach to make, again, make the program a better, you know, a better program. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and, and you know, and, and again, you, and then you, as an assistant, then when you go from being a head to an assistant, you're also, I, I think you're more in tune um, with some different things than, you know, maybe you were as previously as a, as a head coach or that other role as, you know, as you kind of alluded to, I think you're, you go in with a different lens for sure. 
What did you like most about coaching at the college level? What was the one thing that excited you the most every day when you went into practice or just went into your job coaching there? What, what did you really love about it? That for the most part, um, I, you, you, you're, you're dealing with a group of guys or a group of players that one want to be there, you know, every day, like, like, like they, they want to be there. And then the other thing was that you're, you're coaching, uh, you're, you're coaching a group of guys that you don't feel like, um, you know, at the high school level, your, your personnel is what it is. It's who lives in your district. Um, whereas at the, at the college level, although I wasn't highly involved in the recruiting process, it was still like, okay, Hey, these were the guys that we brought here, you know? So having the ownership of, of that versus at times, I think at the, at at the high school level, um, which can be viewed as a positive or a negative, but at times you're, you're, you're handcuffed at times a little bit with this is who you have, like the hand that you're dealt, like now what are you going to do? You know? Um, and so those two things were probably, you know, the, the biggest things that, 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 that I liked was that there was a different level of love and respect for the game and the approach of practice and the approach of the work at the college level than there is at the high school level. And then also you're just able at the junior college level, you're with those guys for so much longer. So the relationships, and even though it's just a two year, you know, even though it's just the community college level and it's a junior college, so there's, they're only there for two years, but the amount of time throughout those two years was a lot more. You just, you, you got a lot more touches with those guys than you did at the high school level, which obviously allows you to build and develop some deeper, more meaningful relationships, which I think I'm really, really big on, especially now what I'm doing now. Um, I'm really big on the relationship part of it. I just think that, you know, um, there's a quote that I got from, I think it was Eric Thomas. And he said, um, without relationship, there are no opportunities. And I've really, really kind of bought into that and, and, and tried to live, live that way, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think relationships are something that, you know, we take for granted sometimes in terms of what those relationships, how important they are to both our professional development and just our individual, you know, development as a human being, the relationships that we are able to cultivate with people, whether it be that player coach, whether it be coach to coach, uh, whether it just be friend, teacher to teacher to student, those relationships are really key to being able to get the best out of anybody, whether that's ourselves or the person that we have the relationship with. I have one more question before we jump into the next part of it related to related to your coaching in college. So while you were coaching, while you were the assistant there at John Wood, were you still teaching? Yeah, I was still teaching. So my, my schedule was bonkers. It was on Like it was, it was unreal. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I was still teaching. So kind of basically what would happen is, um, you know, we would, I would, I made almost almost every every road game um not not all of them it just kind of depended on on when when the guys left you know so like because there were times where you know i was i was at school until you know 2 30 or, or whatever it was you know we, i think at that time i was getting out at 2 30 um and so if they left you know at let's say they left at you know um 11 or whatever it might be then um you know i I would have to miss out on that but yeah i would leave straight from school drive drive across the river um to to quincy and it's about a i mean it's not that the the trip is not bad it's 25 30 minutes so um and and then we would and then i would go to practice and we'd practice and then i would leave from there and then come home and 
wake up and do the and just you know be on that grind <laughs> as we all are Absolutely. you know uh, that you know just the daily hustle but um but yeah no I, w- I went on almost all of the um all the road trips with them um you know that sometimes you know you're getting back at and i'm not telling anybody on this this listen to this podcast anything they don't know you know but you know i go teach all day and then go you know meet them sometimes i'd meet them you know somewhere like on the road and they they'd pick me up and we'd drop my car off at some random gas station somewhere <laughs> and, and and then you know and and then i'm getting back home at you know, two thirty, three o'clock in the morning and wake up and be at school by, you know, seven fifteen. And so, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was a crazy time, but, um, but again, I, you know, I was, I, I think that you, your example speaks a heck of a lot louder than your words. And, and so I wanted to let those guys know that, Hey, this was not just something that, Hey, some former, you know, high school coach is just kind of here to, kind of hang out and you know be along for the ride you know i wanted to kind of earn my stripes so to speak and and you know just <laughs> the same way as i was as as a player you know i i just i just i just had to outwork everybody in, in order to get that you know respect and and i and i just felt like that was that was the only way i was going to be able to do that so yeah, yeah. I, I think that's critically important that kids know that you're all in if you're asking them to be all in and i don't think it matters what level you can be talking about a third grade team you can be talking about a division one college team i think if if players sense that you know a member of the coaching staff isn't all in uh you know i think the level of respect that they have for that particular coach goes way way down and so i think it was you know to your credit that you made every effort possible to get to you know to everything and demonstrate that that you were that you were all in you became a vampire and didn't sleep you kind of remind me of uh, J- of jason and i with the with our with our, yeah. uh, with our with our late night podcasting and i i've told people all the time that there's there's things that you know i have I have my regular day job as a teacher and then I have my, my basketball business and then I have a family and, (laughs) you know, and so, and then I have sleep. And so there, there's, there's something that has to give. And for me, the, the thing that is, the thing that is given has, uh, has definitely been sleep. If you'd have told me when I was, you know, 25 years old that someday I'd be functioning on four or five hours sleep a night, I would have said, I probably am dead. Uh, and and (laughs) now, and now it's just a regular occurrence. So, (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So after your two years there at John Wood, is that the uh, the point where you decided you wanted to pursue getting involved with Pure Sweat, or describe the process for how you got to your current basketball position with Pure Sweat? Okay, I'll, I'll try to be I'll try to be quick with this one, um, just so I don't bore people. But um, yeah, as as I I always knew that that the the off season was always was always the my favorite part of of coaching believe it or not um like i loved the, the like the summer um and the spring and I, I don't know how other states are but i know like in like in missouri they have we, we were limited i think at the time i think it was 25 and now it's down to 20 but we had like we had so they have, they have 25 20 contact days um in the summer and it always just like it that always drove me and it, it still drives me nuts like i just don't get it but um hey ohio we have 10 my gosh how, like i just so there yeah so remind me to come back to the question I have for you. Cause I want to know how in the heck you guys sure. get anything done in 10 days. Um, but, but yeah, we, um, but that was always my favorite time of the year, uh, with those guys. One, I think it was because I was with the guys that I knew wanted to be better. Um, you know, through their actions and, and, and showing up and being consistent. And so they were displaying, I guess, all the things that I hold on a little higher pedestal. So I always knew that that's kind of, that was what I really enjoyed the most about coaching. And so when, when I got, when I kind of came to the realization that, that, that that's what I really enjoyed and was just kind of true and, and honest with myself about that, then then I was able to kind of then shift gears a little bit and to be 
be honest, I actually started um, with uh, with Elevate and 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 Gannon Baker. I actually did did that whole thing and went to Vegas and got certified and and did that whole thing and was actually with them for a while um, for I guess it was about a year. And so I was kind of I was kind of doing some some training with them um, under my own name and and had a handful of kids from the area that I was working with, mostly young kids. You know, I started out with like four kids, um, to be honest. I started out with four kids, and there were just some uh, middle school, junior high kids that knew me from when I was the head basketball coach here at the high school. And so that's kind of how I started. And then <laughs> how I got into Pure Sweat was actually a, a, a guest that you guys just recently had on was uh, Jason Fry. And... Jason, I knew from working multiple um, basketball camps with, and when he first started with Drew, and they decided that that they wanted to kind of bring on you know guys that they thought would be good fits to help build that brand and and kind of build that build that 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 skill development business the way that they felt was best or the way they wanted. He was just he he was relentless. Like he was all, every time he talked to me or saw me or we ran into each other at a camp or he's, hey Matt, like I really I, I I think you would love our approach. I think you'd love what we're doing. I think you'd fit really well. You what you do lines up and is in line with how we want to teach the game and all these different things. And so to be honest with you, finally he just he finally he broke me and uh, <laughs> and he finally he. Finally finally broke me and um i switched gears and that was uh about three years ago uh to be honest with you so that's kind of how i got into into pure sweat and then there's also all those things and we talked about relationships just a little bit ago but you know it's kind of funny um and 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 interesting that i'd also worked a lot of basketball camps as as a young head coach coming up when i first started coaching with drew's high school coach jay blossom um out of st louis and so there so i was connected to drew by two or three different you know degrees um so i i i knew his personality i knew how what his approach was and it, I just knew it was going to be a really good fit, and it was something that that I was in line with in terms of how I wanted to get some things done. And so it, it's been, you know, probably one of the the best decisions that I've made. So describe a little bit about what it is in terms of how they want to teach the game and how you want to teach the game that kind of lines up. What are some of the philosophies, just, you know, kind of a general overview of some of the things that you believe in and that pure sweat believes in that can, you know, that you can share with the audience to kind of get them an idea of what it is that you're doing on a daily basis. I think on, I, I think the, the big overlying thing um, for me and I think for most of our coaches, um, if you'd ask, you know, if you asked any of them would be, would be, would be just would teach that, you know, like, I think that gets lost. Um, we, we don't do, I mean, yes, we do do some drill work, but it, it's more concept driven. Um, and it, it really goes back to studying your craft, studying the game and, the thing that I've just I've just started to kind of realize and put an emphasis on is you can't have one way of teaching take shooting for example like you can't have one way of teaching a skill and that's your only way because that one way is not going to work for every single player and so I think that you know, going kind of staying in that lane of, of of teaching is I think that one thing that we do really really well is we we don't we don't cookie cutter anything. Um, you know, like even for me, like I may have a you know, like in the spring I'll have you know academies for high school players, and we'll go let's say eight weeks. Well my Thursday night group, what they're doing will look totally different than what my Sunday night group looks like. 
just based on who's in there, what types of players are in there. They're still working on the same skill. We're still trying to get the same thing done, which might be, you know, um, you know, uh, wing catch into, you know, reading, do I immediately rip the ball baseline if the defender's in the gap or do I, do I have to have some sort of counter? It should I, you know, shoot, do I have space? You know, there's a hundred different things you can go into there, but it, what, what we do in one group, it will look totally different than the other group, but both of those methods are going to move us towards that desired outcome. So I don't know if that that's kind of a long drawn out version, but I think that that's something that makes us a little bit different than most in my opinion. So from you, from your perspective specifically, how much do you think that your time in the classroom as a teacher and kind of having to do that same thing with your students in terms of, you know, differentiating and making sure that again, not everybody learns the exact same way. How important do you think that is? And obviously it doesn't apply to necessarily everybody who's a skills coach with pure sweat, but it certainly I'm sure applies to you. How do you think that's helped you uh, with the perspective of, hey, I got to do something different for each kid. I can't just have this one way of always teaching something. It's been, I mean, it's, it's been huge. Um, and, and I think that I think that what makes my, you know, story or journey or progression or whatever term you want to use for it a little bit different that from, you know, my process of getting from where I started to here is is a little unique in the fact that, you know, a lot of a, a lot of guys that do what I do now were players at one point and they go to school and then now they do this there's the, there's a ton of really really good ones out there that have that process or something similar to that what i think makes mine a little bit different and what i try to use in an, as an advantage for me is that one i have been in education ever since being out of school but then at the same time like my very first coaching job was a junior high girls job a, a seventh grade girls job like as, as, as I was a seventh grade girls basketball coach right out of college. I, I wouldn't recommend that for any college basketball players going into that though, because that's a, a huge drastic difference from going to a highly competitive environment as a college athlete to seventh seventh grade girls. So you'll and, appreciate this because this you're you're <laughs> you're you're the second consecutive guest. We just had Nick Bartlett from uh, Doctor Dish Basketball on right before you yeah. just recorded with him, and he had the exact same experience. He got done playing, and then he immediately became the coach of a girls middle school team. So he's right there with you. Yeah, you figure out real quick that they that players can't just do what you think they can do like like you think they should be able to do a lot more than they can and your ability to teach that gets challenged for sure and so yeah so i so i i think that my process was you know i went from that to then you know um an assistant high school coach for you know th for three years and then i got my first head job at a small high school and then i got my second head job at a a class four school and then I then I went to the you know junior college ranks which then got me to this so I've had a ton of you know experiences in terms of teaching the game and what I liked what I didn't like and all these different things which is kind of you know all those experiences mold you into what you are now and I do think that that's given me a huge advantage in how I'm able to um, you know teach different levels of kids and then also different kids if that makes sense no it makes total sense can you talk a little bit about what your schedule looks like whether it be on sort of a daily weekly monthly seasonal basis in terms of how much skill development training are you doing are you mostly doing small groups are you doing individual are you doing larger big events clinics explain a little bit about exactly what it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis as a you know as a skills coach with pure sweat okay I'll, 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 so I'll, I'll kind of start with like right now um so like right now you know high school season has started um 
Like uh, I know that, for instance, um, in our area, a lot of junior high stuff has just ended or is just or is getting ready to finish up. You know, somewhere around the first of the year, they'll be finished up. So, like my schedule right now, currently looks like Sunday is my huge day, um, just because like high school kids can't do um, in Missouri, they can't do. Uh, big they can't be involved in group settings um, they can do individual stuff that's fine so Sundays it takes a little bit longer now than in like the preseason or spring or summer because it, um, in, in those in those times of the year you can get groups together you know groups of like eight or you know whatever that might look like for me at that time but so right now Sundays is a really long day Sundays I'm 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 doing youth stuff I do I've got two youth academies um, on Sundays so we'll start at 8 a.m. those will go until one um, and then I will go uh, over and then travel for a half hour get to the next spot do another youth uh another youth group from about 2 to 2 30 and then after that i'll hit um all the individual kids that that need help um or need some need some extra work uh high school players in our area or maybe they don't need it they just want extra work you know um a lot of that is kind of on them and that's that that's part of that relationship building piece that we hit on earlier you know i I, we have pretty good relationships with all of our kids and they're they always know they're able to kind of you know at this time of the year it's almost like you're uh ER doctor, it's like you're on call all the time. Right, yeah, yeah, understood. <laughs> so it's like, hey Matt, what do you got on Sunday at blah blah blah? blah. And I'm looking at them scrolling through my calendar. Uh, what about this? So yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so Sundays are really long days. Then um, then I'll go Wednesdays. Um, but you know I'll have Wednesday nights. I will have um a, another group uh for about an hour. Another young group. Um. And then third, let's see. Like I'll typically, I'll typically probably go to one game um, a week to go see, you know, a client play and do like, do an in-game evaluation for them. Um, not every week, but you know, if, if there's a game that's close enough locally for me to get to, I'll try to go to one one of those a week um, and, and and hit somebody and. You know, during that, you know, I take a lot of pride in, in taking notes throughout the game. And then what I'll do is at the end of the game, you know, I'll talk to them afterwards, obviously. And then and then I'll just text them those notes of just kind of thoughts that I saw, things that they did well, things that, you know, maybe they had forgotten about. Hey, in this situation, don't forget about this. You know, it, just different stuff like that that I think they can use and be useful for them um, that they can look at while they're maybe reviewing their game film or whatever that might be. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, in the gym four days a week right now, typically. Um, and then the other days right now, um, our old, my, my daughter just finished up her season, but, um, for the last, you know, two and a half months or whatever that's been, you know, all those other days are, is, is me teaching from seven thirty to two forty five or two fifty, and then, you know, trying to go either get her to practice and then get her picked up and then run my other, you know, my, my wife owns her own, her own business as well. And so she's running and you, you guys know how that is. So yeah, we, know exactly, yeah, exactly. We, know, we know exactly, we know exactly what you're talking about. Everywhere, you're like, okay, what plate is going to break today? Cause that one's not going to keep spinning. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so, you know, it's, it's busy. Um, it's, it's a hustle. It's a grind, but it's, you know, I, I, at times I feel guilty because to me and you guys can and can I I'm I'm sure can relate to this. I feel guilty sometimes because to me it's not. I don't feel I don't feel the the grind. Like I just I don't feel that because I feel like I'm doing something that I was put here to do. I'm helping a lot of people along the way, and I'm building relationships. And I'm having, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more opportunities all the time because of those relationships. And then you're just, and then you're, again, when you're, when you find something that you enjoy the process of more than the outcome, I think you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
Yeah, I agree. When you can find something that you love where you're not looking at the clock and you feel like you're making an impact on people, to me, that really is what it's all about. And again, it's perspective kind of changes as you as you get older and you do things longer. But I, I can hear what you're saying coming through loud and clear, and that is that you love what you do. And when you love what you do, it, it doesn't seem like work. I tell people all the time that, you know, I, I, you know, I'm doing my basketball stuff and obviously Jason and I are sitting here and it's, you know, 1130 where we are and yeah. we're recording the podcast and, you know, we, we just love the, we love, we love that we love what we're doing as far as this goes. And, you know, I love being out on the basketball court and doing skill development and working, doing camps and the things that, you know, the things that we do here. And there's not one second while I'm doing that where I'm thinking, oh man, 15 more minutes and then, you know, I'm done and I can get out of here. I know, uh, right? You know, I mean, I never, I never feel that way. Uh, and, and to me, that's really what, that's really what it's all about. And, and, and I hear that coming through loud and clear from you. Yeah. And then, and then so like, and then I'll, I'll kind of quickly hit the rest of it, but like spring, spring, we get a lot more group setting stuff, you know, where it's, it's eight to 10 kids. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have high school kids, we'll have youth kids, you know, the, the, we'll obviously group them up, you know, in, in terms of age and, and grade, um, you know, and, uh, that'll typically be in the spring when kids are still in school, you know, that'll be, you know, two to two, probably three to four days a week, um, in the evenings. Um, and then, uh, and then kind of, and then once summer hits that that's when it starts to get kind of really crazy just in terms of schedules one, because I'm more flexible, um, obviously not teaching in the summer. Um, so I, I can do some more things, um, in the, you know, throughout the day. So, so you can kind of spread some things out and, and touch, touch some more, more kids. But, um, you know, we'll have we'll have two or three uh, overseas players that, that that come in that come into town that that I work with um, during that time. You know, they usually get back late spring, um, early summer. You know, and I'm with those I'm I'm with those with those guys probably, you know, three to four three to four times a week um, at minimum um, throughout the summer. And then I'm, I'm also in the summer is kind of my big, my busy time where, where i start to do some more traveling, you know, where we'll do, you know, uh, some, some skills clinics, uh, where we'll go to a, to a destination and put on a, put on a two day clinic or a three day clinic, um, for, you know, a school, or it could be, we've done some things where there's two or three different schools come together at, at, at one location. Um, and we kind of join, you know, bring all those kids together at one spot and do a two or three day clinic. And those are always fun and, and, and challenging because again, it, we don't have a, we don't have a set plan for each of those things. It's not like we have a, a clinic outline per se. It's, you know, I'll usually talk to coach and or talk to the coaches and we'll figure out, OK, hey, what how do you guys envision your teams playing this next you know season? And let's let's make this clinic as valuable as as possible by implementing some things that we think that can help you in terms of how we do what we do. Um, you know, if this were our squad, you know, here are some things that 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 we think you can implement and use in your practices or in your workouts going forward in your off season, in your preseason and into your season. Um, so th those opportunities are always cool. Um, they're always fun. They're always challenging, which is which is the fun part of it, you know, and then at the, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're hopefully helping some coaches and some players. How important is that communication with the players, high school coach to what you try to do? Cause I know that a lot of times when you have people that just hang up a shingle and call themselves a skill development coach there, there's not that communication with the high school coach, especially when you're working with a high school player, Talk about how important that is for you to be able to have a good relationship with a player's high school coach so that you can help them directly with some of the things that they're actually going to be doing in games. It's really, I mean, it, it's really instrumental to be honest. Um, and the reason being is one, I think that, that the trust factor is really, really key. That's huge. When you're, when you're somebody in my position, that's working with a, a a player and i mean let's be honest most of the time it's 
it's that coach's top one, two, or three players, you know? Um, and, and so because those are the players that are obviously putting in the, you know, the extra time and putting in the, you know, the work, but yeah, that communication is big. And for me, just, you know, an example of that would be, you know, some of the things that, that I want to know from them are things like most importantly, what, what are they going to have to be great at for you guys to have a really good year? That is like the biggest question and, 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 and the, the biggest piece of the pie for me, you know, cause that's, that's where I want to spend the majority of our time and our work in working with that, with that player is all right. Hey, th- these are the things that coach is saying that you need to be great at in order for you guys as a team to have a really good year and maximize your year. So that like, that's, that's, a, a question that I always ask every single one of them. And then you can get into other things like, you know, Hey, what are some things that, that maybe they're not, you know, great at right now from a skill perspective that you would like to see them be better at? Is there a spot on the floor where they really struggle that, you know, they're going to be getting some touches there. You know, there, there's a different, there's a, you know, a dozen different things that you can ask outside of that. But that big overlying one, I, I think is key. And I think you can get a lot of work done and a lot of improvement in, getting them to be great at the thing that they need to master for that team to maximize their season. Yeah. That's a perfect question to get everybody on the same page from you as the skill development coach, their high school coach, and then the player themselves to be able to hear what their high school coach is saying and and understand. Cause a lot of times, you know, that's something that not all high school coaches do a great job of communicating that to their players just in season or out of season of, Hey, this is what we need you to do. I'm not sure that that conversation takes place every single day in every single high school program across the country. So to be able to get that message out in front of not just you as the skill development coach, but also to get it out in front of the player, I would guess is really a value to a, you know, to a typical high school coach. Yeah. And, 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 and it gets the, I mean, it, in in my experience, it gets the player, in the in a in a frame of mind to understanding their game and who they are a little bit more as well because i mean i mean you guys have seen you guys have coached coached and and are coaching but like what a player thinks that their role is or what they're good at or what they need to be good at may may not be may not not match up it may not be the thing that that coach needs you to be great at like he might need you or she might need you to be able to do it but there's a big difference in being able to do it three times a game versus having to have that one thing or two things that you're going to have to master and do at a really high level yeah i think if you can get that message across to kids as a coach then you've given them a target you've given them a goal of something that hey this is what I really need to work on to maximize myself and then obviously maximize our team success as well. One question I had for you, Matt, as you were going through kind of your schedule and what you're doing. And when we had uh, John Beck on, we talked to him a little bit about this as well. Uh, What, how do you go about getting your gym time? What's your gym situation? Do you usually typically go to your client schools do you have like kind of a home base facility that you work out of how does that work in terms of you scheduling your gym time because i know that's one of the things that uh, a lot of skill development coaches sometimes struggle with is hey i'd like to do more but i just can't find the gym time to be able to schedule more so how do you go about securing your gym time yeah, a hundred percent. And that's a great question. That's always a huge struggle for everybody that, you know, that that's doing, that's kind of in, in this world, um, of player development, but it's actually kind of both, to be honest with you, for me, um, like this time of year, um, I'm usually going to the, the player's school usually, um, 
and or you know they may know somebody that has the, you know that that that's fortunate enough to have a gym um, of of some sort you know whether that's their could be their church it could be you know whatever that might be but um, th- that's where I'm at kind of a lot at this time of year and then like when we're doing our youth like we were let's see we just finished up actually our fall youth um, uh, player development program and. Um, for a lot of those types of things where I do a, like my academy type setting stuff, um, I either use um, one of the gyms that is at the high school. Um, those are those are hard from a scheduling perspective, um, especially like right now. It's just impossible with all the team. You know, everybody's playing. You know, you've either got games or you've got practices or you know all that stuff. So right now it's impossible. But then I also have um, another location that I use. Uh, that's um, one of a uh, parochial school here in town. That's just a K through eight school, um, and they've been really awesome to work with. And um, you know, it, between me and and uh, you know some volleyball programs and stuff like that, you know, it, it, it's in use a lot. But um, I'm able to manage, you know, squeeze in, you know, an hour and a half or three hours, um, you know, a few times a week. So yeah. So to answer your question, it's a a messy mixture of, of all of those, to be honest. But, uh, I'm really, really fortunate in, in that because I know that there's a lot of guys, um, and, and ladies that, that, that are trying to help kids that, uh, really struggle finding gym time. But I think that again, it, it, it does go back with, to being consistent. It goes back to developing relationships and I think that the more you're in those venues and you're doing things the right way, then I think that obviously, you know, word gets out and, and, and people are more apt to help you if they know that you're bringing, um, bringing some value to, to, to somebody. Absolutely. There's no question. I love what you just said, which is one, you got to be doing a great job. And then two, if you're doing a great job and you've built relationships with your clients and other people, then those people are going to talk to other people and that's how your reputation spreads. And then you end up having a tremendous amount of success. What's the line from that movie? If you build it, they will come. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. And so I think if you're, if you're doing things the right way, uh, people are going to eventually are going to find you. And I know that just, speaking from our perspective that, you know, gym time is, is always a challenge. It's one of the things that I always find is I'm, you know, doing my skill development work that yeah. it's, it's hard to, for me, it's always been hard to find consistent times where I can say, Hey, I, I can always be, you know, Saturday at nine o'clock between the gym schedule and between my own personal schedule with my own family and that kind of thing. And that's always been the biggest, you know, that's always the biggest yeah. challenge. So, so I can only imagine what your scheduling process looks like and how often you're, uh, you know, communicating it's, with family and being, uh, going, all right, I got to be here and there and this and, is where and I'm supposed to be. And, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always, and you guys know, man, I'm always, you know, I'm walking in or sending my wife a text like, Hey tag, you're it. I'll see you uh, tonight. You know, um, Hey, is, 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 are are the girls okay? Does do, do I need to pick them up from somewhere that I don't know where they're at? Where are they? What do they got next? Yeah. So it's, um, but you know, you, you just, I, I, again, it goes back to that thing you hit on, um, earlier on in this, in this conversation was, it's it's about choices um and i think that if you you know i just i as a matter of fact i just i just saw something on uh with with kobe the other day um an interview that he was doing and it was about sacrifices um and i actually think i shared it on one of my one of my i might have put it on twitter maybe or something but um it was it was it was it was talking about sacrifices and he said that if you feel like you're if you feel like you're making sacrifices or that you're having to sacrifice something then you're probably not doing what you need to be doing or should be doing or were put here to do. So, and, and I thought that was an interesting perspective. Yeah, I think it's a totally interesting perspective. I, I can I can relate to that in a way that, you know, people used to ask me when I was a kid, and I think of it more from a playing perspective than I do from a coaching perspective in this particular manner. But, you know, people used to ask me, oh, you know, did you did you miss out on doing this or that when – 
you know, when you were playing, I always felt like, you know, there was, there was no place I would have rather been than in a gym playing basketball or working on my game. So I never felt like I missed out on a party or a dance or whatever the case might've been because mm-hmm. I was going to play. I, I never looked at it as a sacrifice. People on the outside, friends or, you know, other, you know, my friend's parents or what, you know, whatever may have looked at it as, boy, Mike's really sacrificing a lot to be a great basketball player. And I never looked at it that way. I looked at it as, you know, if I had a choice between option A, which was doing something else, and option B, which was playing basketball, well, I knew where I was going to be. It was option B, and I was going to be playing ball. So um, I never looked at it as a as a sacrifice yeah. in any way. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I want to wrap up here um, with you, Matt, just by asking you to uh, kind of give an idea of what you see in the future for what you're going to be doing going forward. Do you have any kind of new ideas or thoughts of things that you're putting together in terms of, you know, your training, maybe some different uh, group activities or clinics or anything new coming down the pike? And then after you answer that, if there's anything else that we haven't touched on tonight that you want to share, go ahead and do that. And then we'll ask you to throw out your contact information to people who want to reach out to you after listening to the podcast. Perfect. Yeah, um, you know, kind of w- one thing that I that, that we do have coming up um, that I'm interested uh, to see kind of how it goes because it's something that I haven't done before. Um, but it's something that that me and and kind of a few of the guys kind of in my inner circle have have talked about, and I know that some of them are kind of rolling out some similar things as well. But something that I'm interested in seeing how it goes, and I'm I'm excited about it because it's different, but is we're gonna do a we're gonna do a three on three developmental league, um, and and kind of what it's gonna look like. And the, my my vision for it is is to kind of mesh the worlds of player development and skill development, and competition, and basketball IQ. And so, what we're gonna attempt to do here is. And this is going to be youth driven, so we're going to go grades five through eight um, to start, and 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 we're going to you know we're going to kind of keep it small the first this first go around in the interest of kind of trying to hopefully get it right for sure. But um, gosh, I just think that three on three at that level, um, at those age levels, is a really really ideal way to teach the game. Um, you know, there's just so many more touches. Um, there's so many more decisions. There are the spacing is so much better. Um, the amount of repetitions that 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 you can get done in a shorter amount of time is a lot better. You know, is is obviously more and greater. Um, but kind of what what we're gonna do, I think, is is we're gonna we're gonna spend some time in the, in the first four weeks doing some skill development um, and player development, and then also. We're going to pick a handful of actions, I think, um, and I haven't decided on what those actions are going to be, but, and, and we're going to kind of teach these kids, okay, in this, and, and we'll obviously pick popular actions, so maybe take a you know wide pin down or down screen, for example, and we're just going to kind of try to introduce them to three basic, simple progressions out of that action and we're going to kind of control that three on three and kind of force them to play three on three out of those actions each week and then at the end of the thing i think we're going to you know have several weeks where they show up and it's and it's we're going to it's going to be like league play where we're going to you know we're going to have winners we're going to have losers um you know we're going to keep the records you know for you know the last i don't know three four weeks whatever it might be but uh, but yeah, I'm I'm interested to see how that goes. I I think that's a that's something that is is a little different and hasn't necessarily. I know it hasn't been done in in my area um, because everything is so five on five driven. Um, so I I'm interested to see how much more comfortable these we can get these kids with playing basketball in a somewhat organized manner that's not overly organized if that makes any sense at all uh, that makes total sense i love that uh one of the things that i'm I, i've become a huge proponent of of three on three and i really think I, i've made the case on the podcast before that 
you can I could make the case that you could play three on three up through sixth or seventh grade and never play any five on five at all. And if you just did that, you'd probably be a much more skilled player by the time you got to eighth grade. If all you had done is played three on three for all the reasons that you mentioned. So I'm actually working on, uh, for the first time, I'm actually going to do a, I'm, I'm going even younger than you. Uh, I've, I was asked to put together a kindergarten through third grade um, sort of developmental league and kind of put together a blueprint. Awesome. And, and my blueprint is sort of very similar to yours in that, you know, we're going to do probably half skill development, maybe even more than that at the beginning in the first couple yeah. of weeks and then play three on three. And we're going to have um, not necessarily coaches for each team, but we're going to have coaches on the court sort of directing uh, yeah, and helping the, helping the actions awesome. where, where it's not focused on, the the you know the coach isn't worried about am I going to win the game the coach is worried about am I helping the kids to develop and really learn yeah. how to play the game and so again this will be our first time doing it too so ours is starting in January so I'm excited just like you are for the same reasons to see how that goes and you know to try some different things and hopefully continue to work at it and tweak it and perfect it and then hopefully get an opportunity to take it, not just with the, you know, this initial location and group that we're going to work with, but hopefully be able to take that elsewhere, take it on the road and be able to, you know, impact kids in other places as well. So I, I think you're, I think you're onto something. I think if we could push more three on three in the basket, in the youth basketball space, I think we'd all be a lot better off. Man, I know these high school coaches would be a lot better off. I know that. Yep, absolutely. So can you go ahead, Go ahead, can you go ahead, Matt, and share out uh, your contact information of how people can reach out to you if they've listened to the podcast and want to just, uh, you know, maybe they have a question for you or maybe they're in your area and they want to, you know, get out and train with you. Uh, go ahead and share out that contact information if you would. Yeah, I'll give you um, – and, and I, I, I'm, I'm pretty active on, uh, on on all the social platforms, to be honest with you. But um, on my email, um, that that's always a, a good way to reach me as well. Um, my email is m pew p-u-g-h at pure sweat basketball.com and then um i'm at coach matt pew on instagram and twitter and then facebook also have matt pew pure sweat basketball and then also matt pew pure sweat basketball on youtube where we've uh, actually just kind of started started adding a few more videos um we've actually We've actually got some really good stuff um, out there that we were able to kind of capture in terms of our fall uh, youth player development stuff that we just finished um, this last week. So we'll be rolling out some more stuff, some more content from from that academy that that we did with, uh, with with some of our youth kids so if there's any like junior high coaches out there that are listening or um, or maybe you're a parent that that, that coaches you know um, your your kids team um i think there's some stuff in there that i think can be valuable that you can you know um pick uh pick from there it's not real super overly instructional but does give you a peek into kind of some of the concepts that that we're working on and and some of the things that we feel like is important for for those younger players yeah, that's fantastic. Anybody who's out there in our audience, uh, you know, I'd highly recommend going and checking out Matt and what he does on social media. He puts out a lot of good stuff, and uh, you know, if you go uh, go ahead and follow him, you're going to get some great information. And if you reach out to him, as you can see tonight, uh, he's more than willing to share uh, all the great things that he's doing with uh, with the players that he's fortunate enough to work with. So, Matt, we want to thank you for jumping on the podcast with us tonight. It's been a pleasure uh, getting a chance to have a conversation with you. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein, Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at raiseyourgamebook.com. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, 
Training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, brought to you by Head Start Basketball.